let's be real here. You've already watched Linus's, Steve's, or Steve's video on these new chips. You know how they perform and how they compare to last gen and to Ryzen 7000. So let's shake things up a bit and do something a little different. I've spent the last week overclocking and testing the i5 13600K to see if it's even worth doing and I found some rather interesting results. Pretending for a second that you haven't already seen the results, Intel basically took their 12th gen chips, doubled the efficiency core count, and called it a new chip. Okay, there, there are actually some uh, kind of key differences, but I would say that's kind of the, the, the main event there. That means that their 13600K now sports six performance cores and eight E cores, making it a 14 core chip instead of a 10 core. That can boost up to 5.1 GHz, which is pretty impressive, although it's worth noting that the i9 will now boost to an astonishing 5.8 GHz in its stock form. I should also mention that the new chips now support DDR5 5600, up from 4800 on the last gen, and of course the new chips are accompanied by a new set of motherboards specifically Z690 boards, which I've been using the ASUS Z690 Strix E for my testing with the most recent BIOS version available to me. So let's get overclocking. This has become ridiculously easy. I did everything through Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility, or XTU, which was fantastic. I started by just trying to increase the power limit. The i5 now has a power limit of 181 watts, up from 150 uh, from the last gen, although, as you'll find out in a second, I'm not sure that this thing got the memo. But still, just increasing the power limit and the boost time, the, the tau time, well, that did nothing. It actually dropped performance ever so slightly, which is just amazing. I don't have any other motherboards to be able to test if this is ASUS's BIOS or a bug with the chips in general, but if you want to push your chip, you'll have to do it manually. This is actually the same experience that I had on the last gen chips, again with ASUS boards, so again I'm not too sure on that one. Happily, manually overclocking, well not only is this thing a complete monster, but it's stupidly easy to do with XTU. You just crank up the voltage uh, a little bit at a time, you bump up all of the core clocks, again a step at a time, and then run a test like Cinebench. Rinse and repeat until it stops being stable. Then either bump up the voltage if your cooler can handle it, or drop the clocks back down a touch. I managed to get the E cores to run at 4.2 GHz on all of them, and 5.7 GHz on all P cores, and even 5.9 GHz on the two faster P cores, which means that this chip is now running around 220 to 240 watts of power consumption, up from, in my testing, just 150 watts at stock. That meant that the Cinebench score jumped from 24,000 points to 26,622. For a bit of context, the last gen 1200K ran around 27,000 points in Cinebench, meaning this overclocked i5 is almost as fast as the stock last gen i9. That's pretty impressive. Taking a closer look at the results, even the single thread performance jumped, going from 1947 to 2143. A similar 10% bump in performance, albeit with about 50% more of the power. In Blender and the BMW scene, the render time dropped from 106 seconds to just 97 seconds, or again around a 10% improvement, and in Gooseberry, it dropped almost a minute off the render type. After some reruns, thanks to some um, instability, the Adobe suite went pretty well. well it went from uh, 953 points in Premiere Pro to 990. It went from 782 points at stock in After Effects to 840, and 1357 points in Photoshop to 1487 with the overclock. Those are some pretty healthy gains. If you're wondering about gaming though, unless you have a 4090, which in which case, why are you buying the i5 and not the i9? I'm not sure that you're gonna see much of a difference. 
Now, I tested these with an RTX 3060, as that's pretty much the card that, at least according to the Steam library, the majority of people who are running this sort of chip would run for their graphics card. And, well, unsurprisingly, there isn't much of a performance difference. In CPU-bound games like CSGO, you do get a healthy improvement. At 1080p, it goes from 565 FPS to 662, or 17% faster, with a near 50 FPS improvement in the 1% low figures too. Even at 1440p, you net an extra 40 FPS average with the overclock, and 22 FPS more in the 1% low. But moving to any other game that isn't exclusively CPU bound, you'll find a distinct lack of improvement. Cyberpunk on medium settings ran at 130 FPS average on both stock and overclocked configurations, and 105 FPS at 1440p. Shadow of the Tomb Raider ran at 137 FPS average on both, again at 1080p, or 94 FPS average at 1440. And Microsoft Flight Simulator ran at 112 FPS average, although here the, there was an improvement in the 1% low figures, at least at 1080p. It's worth noting that I did also try to run both Watch Dogs Legion and Fortnite for these tests, but Watch Dogs Legion still refuses to boot on these hybrid chips, thanks to the, the hybrid design. I think it's easy anti-cheat, just doesn't want to boot with this design. And with Fortnite, unfortunately, it seemed to break mid-run. I got one set of results for the stock testing, and then the second that I did any sort of overclocking, possibly again thanks to easy anti-cheats, I'm not entirely sure, but it refused to load even a replay file, so uh, I wasn't able to conduct any more testing on that one. So unless you have a top tier GPU, or you only do compute heavy work like editing or 3D modeling, you probably don't need to overclock the 13600K. But what about underclocking? Well, I thought that I would test that a little too. I set the power limit to 120 watts, which compared to the stock 180 should be a sizable set of power savings, although, uh, like I said in my testing, it only ran at 150 watts at stock, so, well, take what I can get here. But still, somewhat unsurprisingly, the performance does suffer at least a little in compute benchmarks. Cinebench dropped 22,700 points, down from 24,000 at stock or 26,662 with the overclock, which draws nearly twice as much power, mind you, and the single thread performance dropped a touch too, down to 1911, which is not that sizable of a difference. Blender also showed a decrease in performance, with the BMW scene taking 7 seconds longer than stock, and Gooseberry taking nearly 30 seconds longer. The Adobe Suite performance also suffered a little too, with Premiere running at 934 points, After Effects almost identical to stock at 780 points, and Photoshop taking the biggest hit of all at 1215 points. In gaming though, there isn't much of a difference. CSGO is within margin of error to stock, both at 1080p and at 1440p. Cyberpunk is exactly the same as both stock and overclocked, and so is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. In fact, again, so is Microsoft Flight Simulator. Seriously, unless you do any type of compute heavy work, you are better off saving 30 or 60 or so watts, depending on how you actually have yours run, and just lowering the power limits, because these chips are plenty fast enough for the average GPU. So in short, you probably shouldn't bother overclocking the 13600K, even if it can take a whole lot of pushing. Seriously, running at 5.7 GHz, all core, with an AIO, admittedly a 360mm one, but still, that sort of frequency was unthinkable without liquid nitrogen just very recently but now anyone with a half-decent motherboard, a good cooler, and a few hundred in their back pocket can smash it. 
What a world. If you want to check out the 13600K or Z690 motherboard, I'll leave a couple of global Amazon affiliate links in the description if you're interested. Of course, as you might expect, I have a whole load of testing coming up with these new chips, uh, including hopefully with a full system that has a 4090 in it to do some interesting comparisons and even things like cooler testing to see what size of an AIO you actually need for these things. So do stay tuned. If you want to see those videos, hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Check out some of the other videos on the end cards, because there's a whole lot you can carry on watching. I've been doing this for far too long, so feel free to enjoy. Uh, coming out actually over 10 years of my madness on the internet. Um, otherwise, if you want to support my madness and these tests and all that sort of stuff, you can do so with the links in the description. You can become a YouTube member and get some cool rewards or become a patron if you'd rather. You can also pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs that I made myself. And there's some other affiliate links if you're buying from places like Overclose UK. Feel free to use those as well. Otherwise, that's kind of it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you on the next video.